The following program was made possible by the generosity of those who have determined to hold fast to the true Roman Catholic religion, as expounded by the Roman Catholic Church before the disasters of Vatican II and the so-called New Mass. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost, Amen. Come, Holy Ghost, fill the hearts of thy faithful, and kindle in them the fire of thy love. Send forth thy Spirit, and they shall be created, and thou shalt renew the face of the earth. Let us pray, O God, who didst instruct the hearts of thy faithful by the light of the Holy Ghost, grant us by that same Spirit to be truly wise, and ever to rejoice in its consolation. Through Christ our Lord, Amen. Hello and welcome to What Catholics Believe. I am Thomas Nagley. I'm here with Father William Jenkins. He is a traditional Catholic priest of the Society of St. Pius V, and he serves as the pastor of Immaculate Conception Church right here in Norwood, Ohio. Hello, Father. How are you this evening? Very fine, Tom. Thank you. And you? Just the same, Father. It's good to see you. Yes, you too. Uh, Father, as usual, any prayer requests tonight to begin the program? Oh, always, Tom. Yes. Uh, I thank those who have been praying for Anna, Anna Rajagopal. Anna is doing much better. She's finally home. She's still got a long way to go to fully recover. We hope she does, but we have to pray for that. And uh, I know our family really appreciates all the prayers. And my own nephew, uh, young William Jenkins, just 12 years old, was rushed in for well, emergency surgery for a burst appendix. They're calling it a perforated appendix, but I understand that's the same thing. In any case, um, he was very, very ill and a great deal of pain and is still recovering, probably has a, a week in the hospital just to um, make sure that all is well. Uh, and, but uh, even now, uh, three days after the surgery, he's still suffering quite a bit. So I appreciate your prayers for him. He's quite a trooper. Uh, uh, but I know he appreciates, the family certainly appreciates prayers for him too. And of course, please continue your prayers for uh, Maria Bischel, and uh, please continue prayers for Jonathan Sapp and a goodly number of other dear souls we know who are suffering. Um, again, each time we have the program, I try to vary a little bit because I can't name everybody. Um, but Our Lady knows who they are, and she, uh, she knows the intentions that have been committed to our priests in, in their travels. And so if you pray through her Immaculate Heart, to Almighty God, asking to join your prayers to Our Lady's prayers for these good souls. Uh, they will certainly benefit from that. Benefit from those prayers, and so will you, too, as in a, you are performing an act of charity, and so the graces come to you, too, for praying for them. Uh, also, uh, I always ask for prayers for our country. Um, I, I asked people some time ago to be praying nine every, every day, nine Our Fathers, and also nine times the prayer to St. Michael the Archangel, the prayer of exorcism, actually. Um, the prayer that we pray at the end of the low mass, traditional mass. Uh, and I ask that we pray those prayers for our country, that God will protect, God will convert and then protect, first justify and then sanctify our country. Um, I know people who actually have taken me up on that and are praying those prayers every day, but are actually using the, the rosary uh, as their measure, so they're actually praying ten Our Fathers and ten times the prayer of St. Michael the each, day, uh, uh, each day as a, a decade of each for our country. But our country is in serious trouble, and we, uh, as a nation, need to offer those prayers mm. for our homeland. <laughs> so I, I ask for that, too. Okay, very good. Father, I also you know there was a um, little bit of uh, exciting announcement that you wanted to mention about some uh, possible online course offerings that uh, we may be offering um, in some manner through the, the program here affiliated mm -hmm. with, with WCB. Could you give us a little bit of background about that? Well, one of our great supporters here, uh, in fact, the gentleman who is primarily responsible for making sure the programs are actually uh, on, well, well live-streamed, the, the masses and the uh, holy hours and so on, takes constant vigilance to make sure the live-streaming works and uh, only under the most unusual circumstances has he not actually um, succeeded in getting the live stream going. So he's very, very faithful about that. Yes. But um, 
He's also a resident scholar here on Joanie uh, Salapide and uh, uh, speaks multiple languages, uh, including Latin. Well, he's offering a, uh, a number of courses online through What Catholics Believe. And for our own uh, viewers here, uh, they would have to subscribe to these courses, though. But uh, we'd like to know uh, who in our viewership is interested. And it could be the, the viewers themselves, or it, it could be uh, their families. If they're homeschooling children, uh, they might find these courses very, very helpful to them in homeschooling their children to have someone uh, who knows these languages so well, notably, notably Latin, but also uh, Koine Greek of uh, the New Testament scriptures. So um, we can have Beginner's Latin, and uh, this is a course that was given already a couple of years ago, very successfully too. Uh, those who took it, uh, not only young people, but adults too, uh, praised it and said it was very helpful to them and very well done. So there's uh, Beginner's Latin, there's also a, a Latin so-called crash course, and uh, I think the uh, purpose of that is to, uh, well, not crash, <laughs> um, but somehow in conjunction with uh, enabling, enabling people to begin to understand enough of the Latin to actually begin to apply it to their attendance in Mass. Uh, there's also the offer of uh, the Latin of the Mass in particular, focusing on the text of the traditional Roman Rite of Mass, the Latin and its meaning. And uh, uh, I like to have the, the students here learn Latin well enough so that when they hear the Epistle and Gospel read at the altar, that they can listen to what the priest is reading aloud, and they can actually follow it. They can hear and understand what he is saying in Latin at the altar. Um, there's a course offered in Sacred Scripture. According to the um, exegesis of Cornelius Salapide, you know, we're very fond of Cornelius Salapide here as being a, a great scripture scholar of the 1600s, and he ties together the writings of a lot of the fathers, the commentaries of the fathers, and so on. So he's very informative and uh, very enlightening in terms of the meaning of the scriptures. So if anybody is interested in scripture study or an understanding of the sacred scriptures, this would be a very interesting course for them. Uh, the uh, basically, a commentary of uh, Cornelius Salapide, or or his presentation of the of the commentaries of the fathers of the church regarding books of the sacred scripture, uh, and there's also a, a course offered in biblical Greek. Um, that would be the New Testament Greek. So, um, so anyway, um, these are the ideas that come to mind. This is what. Our, uh, as I say, a resident scholar has uh, said he, he's perfectly capable and willing to offer for those who are interested. So if we have our good folks who are listening or watching online, if they get back to us and let us know yeah. uh, what they'd be interested in, in uh, taking, then great. Perhaps somebody out there would like to take one course. Perhaps there are those who'd like to take them all. I don't know. But uh, in any case, uh, we'll kind of tabulate the interest and get back to them yeah. and let them know. I, I think these courses would probably be conducted in real time, but would also be recorded so that uh, those who don't have the time available when the class is actually scheduled would be able to tap in and view the, the uh, course offering of the classes at any time that's convenient to them. So, in any case, uh, there you have it, and uh, I am very appreciative to our uh, our own resident Cornelia Salapide uh, aficionado for his willingness to uh, to present these courses. Yes, very to good. Offer them. Yeah, that's very exciting. Thank you for that, Father. We will uh, look to hear from our, our viewers there. We, I can't uh, help but think that, that uh, you would also be willing to issue some kind of certificate of completion of the course. Yeah. A successful completion of the course as well. So Very good. Could be uh, help academically too. Yeah. Okay. Well, uh, Father, I have a list of topics here in front of me tonight. Um, one uh, maybe we could start with, not a uh, very pleasant topic, but um, 
recently there's been in the, the news a lot some uh, rather uh, sacrilegious, scandalous to say the least, uh, events that took place at St. Patrick's Cathedral in, uh, in New York City. Um, I'll let you kind of go through some of those details, Father, as much as you're, you're willing to. Uh, some of our well, unfortunately, it, uh, it is so sacrilegious. It's one of those things that you're almost embarrassed to even talk about in polite company. Even in impolite company, you don't want to talk about these things, certainly not in a program that you would like to be suitable as much as possible for young people. Yeah. Um, but uh, no, St. Patrick's uh, a Cathedral in New York, which is considered like a Catholic icon yeah. in this country uh, because of its long and venerable history, uh, actually was this, the scene and hosted through its so-called pastor, um, a funeral for a, how do I put this delicately, a man who cross-dressed as a woman. He was uh, so-called trans, as they call him today. He was also a, uh, what do they call him, sex workers. And that was professionally. <laughs> and he was an atheist. And the cathedral... Uh, with the approval of the pastor there, hosted a funeral for him, which had attracted uh, well over a thousand mourners who were not there to mourn, but were to celebrate uh, the, the life and the death of this, this person and what he stood for. He was considered to be, as they say, kind of iconic in his own right of that lifestyle. And that's what he represented, and that's what they were there actually there to celebrate. They were not there to mourn. They were there to celebrate what this man stood for. Of course, I mean, even the uh, the so-called priest of the, the Novus Ordo priest who was a who conducted this this so-called funeral. Uh, I think his name is Edward Dougherty. Right? Uh, he was born in Louisiana, but moved to Brazil. And he's a Jesuit now from Brazil. Do we know anybody else who gets that description? <laughs> Someone. And uh, he was presiding over this, this, this sacrilegious travesty. And, I mean, he's referring to this, this man um, who went by the name of Cecilia as she and her and using all the right pronouns, you know, to everybody's happiness. And they were even referring to, not him, not, but they were even in their, in their talks about this woman, because they, they do this at the Nova Soto so-called funeral rites. The ma they call it the Mass of the Resurrection. It's not a funeral by any means. But uh, uh, referring to this, this man as St. Cecilia, right? Uh, he was a St. Cecilia of the LGBTQIA plus community or whatever that, whatever that means. And, um, and but all, they, all, they have in, all those, those, those initials have in common is perversion. That's the one thing that binds them all together. You know, that's why they form a community of perversion. And uh, they were celebrating this. And uh, later on, uh, when this was got out, when word got out, uh, there was outrage among the New Order conservatives, okay, uh, who reacted in very characteristic fashion, as though they do not have a clue, really, about the nature of what's going on right now. <clears throat> I mean... Because of the the reaction, the negative reaction to this this travesty, uh, there was a clandestine, that is, secret Novus Ordo mass offered in, in the cathedral to kind of make reparation, but it was kept secret, so they wouldn't have massive protests from the LGBTQ uh, worshippers of this this transgender, this man, pretending to be a woman, uh, they knew that there would be a very violent and obscene protests if they revealed that they were offering some kind of a repentance for what had happened. Right? This was their excuse for keeping it quiet. Um, but they let their word out. And I think even there, they let their word out as, well, perhaps this was done and maybe this was done. I'm not even sure they've confirmed that yet. But the New Order conservatives, not to be satisfied with that, uh, are demanding, I think there are over 10,000 of them now demanding that uh, so-called uh, Cardinal Dolan, 
uh, of New York um, actually do a rite of exorcism in the cathedral. Now, asking a man like Cardinal Dolan to do a rite of exorcism in the cathedral really takes you back to the time that the Jews in the street were accusing Christ of exorcising a devil by the power of Beelzebub, right? Because, but, I mean, the cathedral itself and the archdiocese there needs to be exorcised of men like this Cardinal Dolan, right? They need to drive that modernism and the modernists out because they're responsible for all of this happening. And um, if, if uh, the, I think the only reason why they're reacting very defensively is because there was such a backlash. If there were no backlash, I don't think they'd be apologizing for anything. I think they'd be perfectly happy with it. And, and the new right of exorcism, anyway, that came out um, after Father Amorth complained about the fact that um, Chapter 11 was simply dropped from the Rituale after Vatican II, not reformed. And after he complained, then they came out with some new rite of exorcism, which Father Amorth himself, that's the chief exorcist in Rome for many, many years, said that it was totally useless. Their new right of exorcism, he wouldn't use it. He said, if I had to use this, I'd simply give up. And he continued using the traditional right of exorcism because there's certainly power in it. So, I mean, it, it was a travesty to have this so-called funeral. But it would just perpetuate the travesty to have a, a, a Cardinal Dolan go in and, and perform some kind of a show of exorcism. Um, that... The problem was that the, the exorcism should have been done after the first New Order Mass. Okay, the Novus Order itself is an abomination. It is actually a, a, a step in the direction of the abomination of desolation. The New Order Mass that Paul VI put in, in 1970, I think it was April of 1970, it went into force. Um, and... Um, you know, it, it was uh, a creation, uh, not of Catholics, but it was a creation of modernists. And it was meant to actually replace the traditional Mass altogether in the Latin Rite <laughs> with an ecumenical service. That's what Paul VI called it, the new Mass, he called it. And it was designed to be an ecumenical service because it would not clearly state the truths of the Catholic faith. Uh, what good is a liturgy or worship that does not clearly state the truths of the faith, right? Um, the law of praying, the law of believing must coincide. And if they introduce a new law of praying, they're introducing a new law of believing, and that's what they've done in the new church. Uh, Francis just confirmed that. Basically, he came out and just said, look, we can't carry through this reform unless we get rid of the traditional Mass. We have to get rid of the traditional Latin Mass in order to really successfully complete this reform. And so he's saying that it is at odds with his faith. And uh, that's why they, they need to have a universal use of a new rite, of the new rite that he's still working on. When I was a seminarian over in uh, Rome at the Angelicum, uh, our class was told by the <clears throat> liturgist, liturgy professor that the new Mass that at that time uh, basically was just coming out, um, that that was simply the second step in a five-part process. And we were wondering, well, what's the third, fourth, and fifth step look like if this is only the second step of the change? And where are they taking this? Well, Francis is showing us where they're taking us. Um, and it's basically for neo-paganism. It's neo-pagan worship. Uh, he showed us that through his uh, blessing and, and basically authorizing worship of, of Pachamamba, the pagan idol, in St. Peter's Basilica. Uh, so, um, but all of that has led to this. And there are those even now who are saying that Francis... Um, needs to withdraw his, uh, you know, authorization of blessing these, mm -hmm. uh, these 
the same gender people, and by implication, of course, uh, same gender unions. Um, and they're blaming that, what he, what he did there, giving the, uh, the order to bless these things, uh, as responsible for what's happened in the cathedral now. <coughs> they're actually making a connection, um, which is, it's good that they're actually starting to make these connections. But they should actually, uh, actually think a little more deeply and make the connection with the worship of this idol uh, and connect that to all the perversion that is going on and all that that pagan idol is there for and realize that, uh, you know, as terrible as these things are, they're simply the, the consequences of a sacrilege that Francis has already committed multiple times in his promotion of pagan idol worship and neo-pagan religion that he's teaching everywhere he goes and actually practicing uh, when he came to this when he came to this continent we came to Canada he was actually practicing the neo-pagan yep. religion openly um, so in any case um, um, you know people have to have to realize what's going on they, they have the expression wake up and smell the, the coffee well uh, in this case you have to wake up and smell the incense um, uh, and realize that what the Novus Ordo burns is not incense before God, but it's peyote. I mean, it's it's, it's poison. <clears throat> um, they're not they're not worshiping and honoring God. They're basically uh, replacing the belief in God with uh, uh, pagan idols, essentially. Okay. So, and how did pagans worship their their demon gods? They worship them in the way that these people acted at that funeral. That's what they offered them. They offered them their sins of perversion. That's what they offered to devils in worship of devils, their own perversion yeah. and degradation. By the way, uh, when the, the, rec the, the pastor at St. Patrick's commented on this whole thing, I mean, he's the one who actually authorized it. He said he didn't know what it was ahead of time. Uh, he didn't try to intervene to stop it, of course, um, but he wrote about it and he apologized and objected and protested. What did he protest? The way people acted at the funeral. That's what he protested. The way they behaved themselves at the funeral. Not the fact that this so-called funeral took place in the first you know, instance, but just the way that people were acting badly there. No. So, I mean, even there, um, it, it, they, they turn even their attempts at reparation into basically a farce and another as an insult to God. This is the new order. So anyway, not much good news there, right, Tom? Yeah, that's not Let, a let's very, find, very let's, <laughs> Is there something, uh, uh, some, some good news you get there? <laughs> Wait, uh, we had a question about the rosary, Father. That might be uh, a little more, more Catholic. Mm -hmm. Um we, uh, one of our, our viewers referenced, um, talking about the rosary and how, um, traditionally, you know, there are the, the 15 decades of the rosary that one would pray, but, uh, it's not always possible for, for everyone to pray the 15 decades of the rosary every single day. So, mm -hmm. uh, sometimes we'll just pray the five decades of the rosary each day. Um, but one of our viewers wanted to know if you could explain why we pray those different, uh, we, we pray different decades each day of the week. Mm -hmm. um, what exactly that is. And they also asked about, you know, praying the, the 15 decades, uh, which mysteries should they start with when they're mm -hmm. praying those 15 decades? Well, uh, by popular custom, really, it grew that the, uh, you know, instead of praying the 15 decades of the rosary, the traditional 15 decades, five joyful, five uh, sorrowful. sorrowful, and five glorious mysteries, right? Uh, that people would pray five decades of one mystery. So um, on Monday and Thursday, it became traditional, traditional Catholic practice to pray the five joyful mysteries. And on Tuesdays and Fridays, it became traditional to pray the five sorrowful mysteries. On Wednesdays and Saturdays, again, traditional practice to pray the five glorious mysteries. And one can readily see why one would want that continuity of Monday, 
Tuesday and Wednesday, the joyful, the sorrowful, and the glorious. And then Thursday, again, beginning Thursday, the progression of the joyful and the sorrowful and the glorious. But this left the Sundays. And the Sundays generally would follow the season of the year. For example, during Advent and the Christmas season, one would pray the five joyful mysteries of the Rosary on the Sundays. And uh, then during Lent, uh, one would pray the the five sorrowful mysteries on those Sundays. And then uh, Paschal Tide and beyond, on uh, throughout Pentecost, one would pray the five glorious mysteries. Um, so the uh, for those who are praying only five decades of the rosary and not the 15 decades, because if they're praying the 15 decades of the rosary every day, they would be praying all the mysteries. And for those who, let's say, would be praying five decades of the rosary on Wednesdays, well, according to Catholic practice, um, they would pray the five glorious mysteries. But I, I understand a question arose, <laughs> well, what about somebody who proposes to pray the 15 decades of the rosary? <clears throat> Fears they might not actually complete them. And thinks, well, if I start with the joyful, maybe get halfway through or even complete the five sorrowful, but I'm not able to pray the glorious mysteries, and the glorious mysteries are traditionally prayed on Wednesday, then have I somehow made a mistake? Should I have started with the glorious mysteries and then gone uh, and continued with the joyful and the sorrowful? And, you know, the answer to that question is, it really doesn't matter. Uh, that if, if they really want to be sure, want to be certain to pray the five mysteries assigned to that day by Catholic practice and Catholic tradition, then prudence would say, especially if they're not sure that they will have the time to complete all 15 decades, would say, certainly, start with the glorious mysteries, that's fine. And then afterwards, you're free to pray the joyful and the sorrowful mysteries. But if you feel kind of under pressure because of that, then absolve yourself of that pressure by simply praying the glorious mysteries first. There's nothing wrong with that. There's nothing wrong with praying them out of order, the glorious and the joyful. It wouldn't necessarily even be out of order. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Um, we're just celebrating the mysteries of our Lord's life, death, and resurrection. Yeah. And, um, you know, some people might even say, well, you know, I, I pray the, the sorrowful mysteries best during the afternoon for some reason, because I'm, you know, some, you know, there are people who will tell you, you know, I prefer, uh, and they find it easier to meditate on the sorrowful mysteries. And in that case, they might say, I'd like to, I'd like to pray those when I'm more wide awake, when I'm, I have more leisure time and I'm not under the gun because of other responsibilities. The point is, pray them when you can truly meditate upon them best. Um, and if it uh, soothes your concerns, as I say, uh, you know, pray whatever mysteries are assigned to that day first, complete them, and then you're, you know, at your leisure, you can complete the others uh, later on in the day and, and not, not worry about it. Yeah. The important thing is not to worry about it. Yeah. Okay. Very good. Thank you, Father. That's helpful. Um, we had uh, <clears throat> a couple of great questions uh, about health, some health-related issues, a Catholic perspective on that. Mm -hmm. And uh, one in particular, our, our viewer wanted to know if you could offer just some advice in general to Catholics who suffer with mental illnesses or mental disorders um, listed, for example, obsessive compulsive disorder or depression or panic attacks or anything like that. What kind of advice would you give to someone suffering with those? Well, uh, panic attacks are real, real things. <laughs> right? um, I, I think people who haven't had them, don't have them, don't really, are not familiar with people who do have them, um, would just be prone to say, well, you know, exercise some self-control and just calm down and, and uh, get through it and you'll be fine. But the pat on the head, the pat on the back is not enough. People have real, real, honest to goodness, panic attacks, anxiety attacks. Um, it really can be quite overwhelming. And uh, such that, I mean, there, there are physical effects, physical consequences, shortness of breath, and uh, I mean, just showing signs of real trauma, you know. So, you know, if you were to tell somebody that, it's like telling somebody with, with clinical depression, someone with serious depression, 
well, cheer up. <laughs> you know, it doesn't work that way. Okay, um, it is it is a real affliction that runs very deep, and um, it's just uh, it, it, for many people who have these things, it, it's just quite quite overwhelming. They feel like they're drowning. Yeah. You know, um, so um, so one should. First of all, uh, pray to God for guidance. If, if one realizes I, I'm having these afflictions, whatever they may be, uh, anxiety attacks or depression or whatever else, and there's a lot of that going around today. I mean, I, I think we're, we're sort of in the therapist uh, era of history where it's almost as though if you don't have a therapist, you're, you're not really living your life. That... Uh, there's something wrong with you if you don't need a therapist. You know? uh, so it's almost like the mentality, I'm not comparing therapy or therapists to alcohol or drugs, but the mentality that if you don't drink, there's something wrong with you. If you don't need a drink, if you don't need drugs to get by, you know, there's something wrong with you. There's a mentality there. If you don't consider yourself a victim and brood about that, <clears throat> Uh, then there's something wrong with you that you don't even realize that you're a victim, you know, and you're, 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 there's something wrong. It's as though the, the whole scenario of mental health has shifted over to, you know, you know you're, you're doing well when you have these problems. If you don't, that's highly suspect. Mm -hmm. And there's something truly, truly pathological about not having these problems, you know. Uh, but that's how it's it's become that the uh, the uh, the pathological has become the norm, as such that the norm has become pathological. What is normal in former days would have been is now considered pathological. So uh, this makes it very hard for people who really are suffering um, to really have their suffering taken especially when everybody's clamoring, oh, I've got this problem, I've got that problem, I have to go to a therapist, then people who really need help and some serious help are kind of drowned out by this clamor that, oh, you know, everybody has this, you know, we're all in this together. Um, that shouldn't in any way distract us, though, and make us uh, take lightly the fact that there are people who really are suffering with genuine uh, pathologies and um, and some real you know you call it mental illness if you you know if you want I don't know that depression is a mental illness I don't know if uh, anxiety attacks necessarily constitute a mental illness um, personally I, I think there well there can be a metabolism problem I mean we know that the metabolism can cause very serious effects in the brain, in the way the brain functions. And uh, so, you know, anybody who's suffering such things, I would recommend, first of all, praying seriously to Almighty God for help, guidance, strength, uh, endurance and perseverance, but also for enlightenment as to what can I do? What practical steps should I take? I mean, they can look at this as a personal problem. Oh, woe is me, I'm suffering, and they are suffering. But they have to get through that to think of it as a practical problem if they're going to be able to find any practical solution. They have to be able to isolate it as a practical problem even while they feel as though they're treading water just to stay afloat or, you know, <clears throat> trying to get through the day. They, they need help from Almighty God and from competent and caring people to guide them as to what help is available and how to seek it, mm. how to find it. <laughs> and, uh, you know, nowadays they have antidepressants and they have all kinds of uh, chemicals, that is, I suppose, brain altering chemicals. Um, everything from, uh, well, alcohol, some, I mean, people have from time immemorial used alcohol to. Uh, induce brain-altering effects, right? Um, drowning their sorrows or whatever else. Um, and now it's extended to medical marijuana and so on. 
But, but the thing they all have in common is they actually all induce changes in mood and thought patterns and so on. Um, so the difference between taking one drink, let's say one beer, and drinking 10 beers is that the person who drinks one beer is not looking to become drunk. The person who starts out drinking 10 beers uh, is drinking for the sake of getting drunk. And uh, that's why drugs are always wrong unless there is some proportionate need for them. For example, surgery or so on. Um, because the purpose of using the drugs is to achieve the mind-altering state. Right from the start, that's the whole point, using the drugs. It's not necessarily the point of taking a drink uh, to induce mind-altering effects. But it is the case in using a drug. The mind-altering effects are the whole point of taking it in the first place. And that's why it's so sinful, and generally mortally sinful to do that. To do that to one's brain in order to affect one's thinking. Um, now, you know, we have sleeping bills, we have other things that we use to, um, you know, overcome certain other pathologies. Um, uh, sleeplessness is a problem, and we need sleep, and uh, so we can actually use these things to help us to achieve something normal and to defeat something pathological. But the need for these things in order to function at all already indicates there's, there's, it's a pathology present, right? Mm -hmm. So, you know, to, uh, to really address this question, well, you'd have to have a doctor who's a Catholic doctor who understands the faith, but who also understands medicine and can give some good <laughs> advice in this. But as far as spiritual advice is what they're looking for here, they should pray, they should talk to their pastor, he should know somebody they can talk to. If he can't advise them well, he should know somebody or find somebody for them who will advise them well. A Catholic who understands, again, the Catholic meaning of the soul and uh, grace and so on. Mm -hmm. And um, the priest uh, then will be, be praying for them continually, uh, that God, you know, guide them and strengthen them. And um, he'll be educating himself on what the problem is and trying to be as much help as he can be. But as far as there is um, uh, some medical inter intervention necessary, then he'll have to do his homework mm -hmm. and try to, try to help that person find that medical intervention. Yeah. Uh, meanwhile, you know, I, I think one of the most important things the priest needs to do is try to keep the person on track um, by bolstering them and uh, preventing them from going off track um, by uh, looking for solutions that are actually not solutions, but they're like the devil's solution to the problem the devil causes in the first place. Mm -hmm. And that's what the devil is good at. He's learned over time to cause a problem and then be waiting there with the perfect solution <clears throat> Ultimately, he wants to give the solution to the problem, which ultimately will lead someone to damnation. You know, the permanent, the permanent uh, problem, <laughs> which he will consider he considers the permanent solution to his malice. Yeah. Uh, so the priest really needs to advise the person <clears throat> uh, what not to do as much as what to do. And uh, again, Tom, this gets back to, I'll just finish with that. So, you know, we're talking about <clears throat> the, the, the first of the cardinal virtues, after faith and hope and charity. <clears throat> there are four cardinal virtues, which basically include all the other virtues. And you know what the first of those four cardinal virtues is. Okay. You know, prudence and justice and fortitude and temperance, right? Prudence is at the top of that list. Just after charity, prudence. And basically there are two rules of prudence. Um, following faith, hope, and charity, prudence <clears throat> dictates our actions. And the second rule of prudence is always <clears throat> if there is something you can do, or something you can say that will help make things better, then by all means, 
say it or do it, say it in the right way, do it in the right way, so that you can hopefully <clears throat> produce some very good results. <clears throat> That's the second rule, though. And sometimes there's nothing we can think of or to say or do that we really expect is going to make things better under the circumstances. Then we should pray to God to enlighten us, to show us, right, if there's anything we can do. But the first rule of prudence is always, whatever you do, don't make things worse. Because we can always find a hundred things, a hundred ways to make things worse. Yeah. We can say the wrong thing, and we can say it the wrong way. We can do the wrong thing or do it the wrong way, and just, just <laughs> increase the, the problem, right? Uh, aggravate the problem. That's very easy to do. Uh, that's why the first rule has to be, whatever you do, just avoid making things worse. And that's why when the priest is talking to somebody who's suffering with these, uh, these afflictions of depression and, and uh, panic attacks or whatever, or anything else that, you know, might fit on that list, um, the priest has to be able to help the person, first of all, not to make it worse. To keep them, you know, from out of, not getting in trouble with it, uh, but then also trying to help them as far as he possibly can to make things better. It's uh, ultimately going to have to be a spiritual solution. Father, you you uh, kind of alluded to this, but why do you think there uh, there seems to be almost like an explosion of these uh, these afflictions, these mental disorders, <clears throat> or, or whatever you want to call them? Um, I think it's diabolical influence in the world. Yeah. I think it's diabolical influence in the world, and the world itself has become kind of irrational. Um, I mean, we think of social media, I think of the news outlets and so on, uh, the discord, the disconnect, the cacophony, the, uh, the irrationality things that are coming at people from all directions. I mean, imagine a child growing up in a dysfunctional home uh, which is completely ruled by the parents' feelings and emotions at every given moment. And very erratic parents who um, create a kind of chaos in the home. Emotional chaos, right? Psychological, intellectual chaos, spiritual chaos in the home, right? Imagine a child growing up in those circumstances. Uh, how is that child going to effectively reach the age of reason when he's surrounded by irrational adults. <laughs> and um, a child like that is going to be suffered, you've got to be traumatized. And uh, that's what we see. I think people are traumatized today by just the erratic and it's, it's not just in a rational world. We're living in a world of liberalism, uh, call it progressivism. We're living in a world of wokeism, and we're living basically in a world that is not just irrational, it's anti-rational. There's a big difference. It's actually anti-rational. It rebels against the rational. It condemns the rational. Um, I mean, even condemning mathematics as uh, doing well in math as white supremacy, you know, come on, you know or uh, wanting to be able to express yourself well in your, your native language as an example of white supremacy. I mean, this is insane. But our children are, are being raised in this mentality. But it affects not only the children, it affects, it affects the adults who have to deal with this day in and day out, mm -hmm. in the workplace, and where they shop, the media, and so on and so forth. Uh, it's like a hammer blows. Yeah. So I, I really think uh, a lot of this, uh, the mental aberrations of the present day are the effect of uh, either people being um, derationalized uh, and some who are trying hard to maintain some rational sense of things and especially faith well, let's just say that trying to maintain some kind of sense of reason are being traumatized by this. 
because it's almost like they're in enemy ter- they're they're captured by the enemy, being held in a concentration camp, and being brainwashed, yeah. being hammered, being strapped in the in the chair and and forced to you know endure endure this onslaught day by day. But the only way really to fight this is by faith. The power of faith, and I mean true faith, not 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 false faith. Um, but the, the true faith is necessary to really fight this and uh, see your way through it and recognize it and to love the truth. I mean, that's what St. Paul said in the um, Second Thessalonians chapter 2 with the coming of the Antichrist. He said that there will be those who will not be deceived by the Antichrist. Those who, vast majority of mankind who will be deceived will be deceived because they received not the love of the truth, quote unquote, St. Paul. They received not the love of the truth. Implication is those who will not be deceived by the Antichrist, those whom the Antichrist will not be able to fool, will be those who love, who have received the love of the truth. And that is what is necessary today to, um, to just overcome uh, this trauma of a, of a deranged world. Mm-hmm. Well, Father, the, uh, the spiritual aspect certainly makes sense, but do you attribute any of this to, to any physical causes? Well, as I you... mentioned, there are metabolic, metabolic problems, too. Yeah. <clears throat> but, I mean, we have to remember that sometimes the, the trauma uh, can actually induce, at least I, I believe, for what it's worth, induce met- problems with metabolism. I mean, our brains are formed, and... Um, as our brains are formed when we're, when we're young, I mean, we're, we're being formed by sensations and by stimuli that we receive from the outside world. Does that affect the formation of the brain? Of course it does. You know, look, look at, I mean, extreme example, feral children who are raised by animals in the forest, believe it or not, I mean, there have been cases of that. And um, they crawl like animals, right? They eat like animals. Uh, they have to be trained almost to function, uh, to resemble human beings. Can they learn to speak? It's very difficult. Why? Because the brain is formed without, without speech, <clears throat> being raised by animals. Even though our brains naturally have this kind of grid of neurons, which is uh, actually universal in the human race, to so a no- normally formed brain has that same pattern of uh, neurons made there, made for language. And if uh, someone grows up and uh, they grow up in a nonverbal society, you know, a home where the, their mothers and fathers don't talk, right? When they, the children are ignored, no one even talks to them or reasons with them or, or reads to them or anything of the kind. Children like that can grow up very nonverbal and uh, have a terrible time expressing themselves or, not only making themselves understood, but even understanding what others are saying. Uh, I think we're seeing that in the young, younger generation now. I think an example of that would be the, the COVID lockdowns. And uh, that university now, people are saying this did a lot of damage to the, to the intellectual development of the children who were locked down during that time. Mm-hmm. What about things like the food supply? We hear a lot about that today, how our food supply is poison. There's so many chemicals and everything. Mm-hmm. None of our food is really very natural anymore. Would you attribute any of this? Well, I, I, I think you're absolutely right about that. Um, yeah, I think that, that certainly has to have an effect because, you know, the brains grow, but they, they grow by the nourishment that we take in. And the brains are constructed. The neurons are, are built of these materials. We feed them, right? So if uh, we, we're feeding them, uh, if, if the food we eat is devoid of these necessary nutrients, on the one hand, and on the other hand, poisoned, that's going to necessarily have an effect on how well the brain can form and how well the brain can perform. Mm-hmm. But I, these... I, don't, I, don't, I don't think I'm overstepping my bounds mm-hmm. in saying so. I don't think I have to be a physiologist yeah. <laughs> uh, to say that. I think it's just common sense. Mm-hmm. Well, Father, these things all kind of seem like uh, something that previous generations didn't have to deal with, at least to, the, mm-hmm. to this extent. So mm-hmm. do you think... Um, Maybe it's it's unfair sometimes to kind of uh, attribute some kind of moral weakness, maybe to to younger generations um, that we see in the world today, where it's um, the the truth is maybe that they have so many more things to deal with. I mean, maybe they are victims, right? Maybe and victims of a world that 
our generation, the generation before is created in a sense. Yeah. 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 I, I think there's something to <clears throat> something to that. Yeah. At the same time, I mean, I, I don't think we should necessarily expect any less of them. Yeah. Uh, because they need they need that. And we, we need to give it to them. They might have to work harder for it, but they need it even more than we do, I think, because of what's coming. And so we still have to give them everything we possibly can, even if we think that, yes, they've been poisoned by uh, big corporations and big pharma and all the rest with all their chemicals. Uh, I mean, personally, again, getting a little controversy here, but... I mean, I think what's what's coming out of one of the biggest nations in the world now um, and its Communist Party it basically is just, I think the whole world is being poisoned by by the Communist Party of that nation. I think they're assassins, like assassins of the world and poisoning the entire world. Um, and um, unfortunately, I'm, I'm sorry to say that, you know, gigantic corporations are seem to be for the because of the money involved uh, on the take and they're going along with this promoting it and I really do think it is a matter of assassinating the world uh, by poison but uh, that's my own personal uh, thought for yeah. what it's worth yeah. Yeah. and well, yes the children are going to be suffering because of it we have to try to protect them as much as we can from this but also uh, give them as much good as we can going forward yeah give them especially faith and hope and love for god yeah well that's uh very interesting father maybe um if uh if you're up for it maybe just a couple more questions rather quickly we could uh work through these um a very good question from one of our viewers wanted to know uh, how a catholic should respond to someone who uh uses the spiritual but not religious uh, kind mm -hmm. of tagline that's very popular these days. You hear a lot of people say that, but how, how should a Catholic respond to that? And these the same people will say things like, uh, you know, our, our Lord, when he was here on earth, he never actually intended to uh, have established any kind of organized religion or organized church. Um, this is all kind of an invention, and we should really just be this kind of spiritual but not religious. How would you respond well, to that? Well, it's easy to say. People say that who are ignorant <clears throat> or deliberately deceptive because... It's clear from the Gospels that our Lord actually established his church and all of the imagery he gave for that church in his parables is of something highly organized. Uh, some, uh, multiplicity of individuals bound together, right, by a common faith and hope and love. When our Lord gathered his apostles, right, uh, he uh, was actually going to form the nucleus of, the, of, of a hierarchy of authority in them, and he gave them that authority, and he explicitly gave them the command, going therefore, preach the gospel to all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son of the Holy Ghost, and instructing them to observe what things I have commanded you. Now those three elements are the elements of an actual society, not just some uh, amorphous mass of doing and believing whatever you want, our Lord even said, the one who, one who believes uh, and actually acts upon that belief, obviously, he believes and he has to be true to that belief, will be saved, and those who do not believe will be condemned. So immediately, I mean, you have a very clear delineation there, marking a society of believers who believe the truth and actually act according to the truth, right? So this is what the apostles themselves understood. And from the very beginning in the Acts of the Apostles, we see them acting exactly in this way, that they saw this as a very, very definite social bond, but a social bond based upon supernatural truth, the gospel that they preached, our Lord's own message, right? <coughs> and his instructions for our behavior to belong to that society, and even the sacramental beginnings of belonging to that society, the gateway into this, in, into that the church, right, as he says, the kingdom of heaven, through baptism. So these are all very, very definite things that delineate uh, the church that Christ established. The very idea, when our Lord says, my church, my church, the very concept of a church indicates religion. Of course, not just that I'm being sort of personally spiritual, but I actually 
belong to a church, as they belong to the fold, like the sheepfold, right, with the shepherd, the pastor, and so on. So, uh, so people who, who say this are just basically trying to falsify Christ's teaching. And they're trying to basically supplant and reject what he actually said and what he actually did with their own airy notion, gaseous notion of just uh, uh, what they call spirituality. You know? But I, I think there's actually something even a little more sinister to it than that, uh, as if it were possible to be more sinister than falsifying the teachings of Christ. Um, you know, in, in our own day, there, there is a continue, continuation of an ancient, ancient heresy called Gnosticism. And the teaching of Gnosticism um, goes back, uh, actually, to the very be beginning, the very beginning of mankind. I mean, you might say that the very first temptation in the Garden of Eden, coming out of the mouth of, the, uh, of Lucifer, right? disguised as a serpent, was Gnosticism. I mean, what he was proposing to Eve was, if you defy God, then you will have your eyes opened, and you will be as God. And, um, you know, people say, well, wait a minute, what is the significance of that? Where do you, how do you get this? Well, it says it, but, but it, Lucifer said, Basically to Eve, the reason why God told you not to eat of the fruit of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil is because he knows, God knows, that when you eat of that tree, you will be as God and you will realize you are God. And that's the meaning of Gnosticism, the knowledge that you are God. And Gnosticism uh, proposes from the earliest ages that there is a good God who is a real God, and there is a false God. Sometimes they call him the demiurge, the half-made the half -made power or whatever, the half-created, half as though he's somehow a mutant. And he's the evil God who created this world. Now you see where the message is coming from. This message is now being conveyed, by the way, by Amazon Prime, because they are actually producing a series showing a cartoon series portraying Lucifer as the hero and the creator as the evil one. And this is Gnosticism. It's evil, it's Satanism, basically, by another name. And, um, you know, the Gnostics had taught for many years that they portray the good power and the evil power as darkness and light and so on and so forth. But, um, all this other imagery all comes down to the idea that there is a, a, a true good God and a fake kind of half mutant God who created the world and who basically overcame the true good God by shattering him into billions of shards of pieces and embedding, and, and embedding those pieces in the world, basically imprisoning the, those pieces of the true God in the world and uh, blinding them to the fact that they are God. And uh, the souls of men, the spirits of men, are those pieces of the spirit of the true God, who are imprisoned in this world by this evil creator, who has bound us here by all of his commandments. And um, how, how do we save ourselves? How are we saved? I mean, if they have an idea of, of Christ coming, what was his message? Well, according to the Gnostics, this is how they tried to spin this in their fake Gospels that they wrote and putting the names of apostles uh, or Mary Magdalene or some other biblical figure. Even back in the early centuries of the church, they were spinning out these Gnostic Gospels to try to kind of co-opt the teaching and create a Gnostic Christ whose message was that salvation is from the knowledge that he their false Christ brings that you are God and knowing that now enables you by that knowledge, that's what Gnosticism means, Gnosis means knowledge, a secret knowledge, that you discovered now that you are God and now you are on the way to salvation, of rescuing yourself from this world 
escaping the clutches of the evil god and returning to your true state as divine being. So you have modern Gnosticism. And, you know, the, the, actually there are some substantial sites on the, the Internet uh, for this Gnostic church and the Gnostic teaching. There's modern, modern Gnosticism. But actually, it actually says that there are three states of mankind. And the, the grossest state, the lowest state of man, uh, is of those who believe in materialism, that everything is just materialistic. And there's nothing that's not just chemicals and atoms, no spirit of any kind. That's the lowest state. And then they say that the next state, that is those who rise above that, are the religious ones. Okay, they're religious because they still, recognizing the existence of spirit and that they have spirit, that they are bound by the moral code of the world. The moral code of, let's say, the creator God, the creator, they found, find themselves bound by moral principles. And to that extent, they still are bound here in this world. But the third, the highest state, is the state of the spiritual. And those who are spiritual have escaped the religious mode of ritual and moral code and so on. They're above all that now. And they just exist in the spiritual plane because they've come to realize their own divinity. And the next step for them, they return to their godlike state. Not godlike, they return to their divine state. It's not just godlike, because they are divine. Uh, that's, the, that's the gnosis, that's the secret knowledge. Uh, I mean, whether you're looking at masonry, uh, Freemasonry, or any other you know, form of Gnostic teaching, uh, Mormonism, you know, it, it all comes down to that, that we are God. Exactly what Lucifer first, first proposed to Eve, the very thing that got him, right? The very temptation that he found within himself, right? Because he was so enamored of his own perfections. He simply declared himself his own God. The same temptation he uses against every one of us. Yeah. So, you know, when, when somebody tells you, well, I'm spiritual, not religious, they may not, you know, be dyed in the wool Gnostics and not be studying up on their Gnostic, <laughs> Gnostic beliefs. But, you know, they're, they're expressing this very idea. I mean, this is all part of the occult, too. I mean, look at uh, Aleister Crowley. And uh, his order of the or Orient Temple, you know, the Orient, uh, and, um, and, and all of that, I mean, he was involved with Freemasonry, he was involved with the occult, definitely, up to his ears. He called himself the wickedest man alive. But again, the, this, the, the whole point is uh, being man pretending to be God. This is the, this is the message here. Man convincing himself that he is God. It's, um, it's the common thread that runs through it all. So, yeah. it's expressed in that idea, unfortunately. I'm spiritual, but not religious. Mm -hmm. Well, Father, maybe uh, let's end there. And um, anything in, in closing for us? Well, Tom, uh, we'll probably take up some of the other questions we didn't get to today. We'll take them up next week, maybe. That's planned, Father. Okay. In the so, meantime, more questions will come in. So, <laughs> yes, uh, but uh, hopefully <clears throat> people will get some answers. Um, next week, let's just try to... Uh, I know I'm talking to myself, not to you so much. Um, but let's uh, try to, uh, you know, uh, leave 25 words or less in our answers, okay? <laughs> we can try to pledge that. We pledged that before. When I said we'd go on a diet for Lent, right? A word <laughs> diet. You know, we are in Lent now. Uh, we had the first Sunday of Lent just a couple of days ago. We read about the temptations that afflicted our Lord in the desert, right? He was actually led into the desert by the Holy Ghost. Some people have a little problem with that because they say, it says he, our Lord was led into the desert by the Spirit, by the Holy Ghost, that is, to be tempted. 
as though the Holy Ghost was leading our Lord out there in order to subject him to temptation. Well, we have to understand that. Our Lord wasn't being led there against his will. Um, actually, quite the contrary. He came into the world to suffer for us. And these temptations were among those things that he chose to suffer for us. And the reason why he chose to suffer for them, for us, suffer them for us, was to show us how to deal with temptation. And uh, also to uh, kind of set the, set the stage, as it were, uh, for his public life that followed and his passion and death. You see, the, the, the three temptations that our Lord underwent really corresponded to what St. Paul would later call the um, concupiscence of the uh, flesh, the concupiscence of the eyes, and the pride of life, right? Uh, concupiscence of the flesh, looking for physical pleasure, certainly avoiding pain and discomfort. Well, our Lord was hungry. The Gospel says after fast fasting, 40 days and nights, our Lord was hungry was hungry and thirsty out there in the desert. There was pain. And that was a temptation that uh, came to him from uh, Lucifer. But Lucifer wasn't just trying to, he wasn't tempting our Lord to sin. Uh, that's usually what his temptation is. He was tempting our Lord to reveal whether or not he was the Son of God. And if he was the Son of God, to perform a miracle at Satan's behest. And, you know, right there, it shows you what a knucklehead Satan is. Because, I mean, doesn't this angelic spirit realize that if this is indeed the Son of God, he's going to know who he's dealing with, and he's not going to do what, what he he's, is suggested by this bad, bad actor, Satan? Doesn't he realize that if this is the Son of God, He's going to see right through him, and he's not going to do what he's suggesting. I mean, no, Satan is so proud and arrogant, I guess it, it doesn't occur to him. <laughs> he thinks he can somehow outwit the Son of God. Uh, if you're the Son of God, command that these stones may be made bread. And then our Lord quotes scripture, right? Not by bread alone doth man live, by every word that cometh forth from the mouth of God. And that's an interesting answer, because man lives by every word that comes forth from the mouth of God, and he is the word of God. So Lucifer hears this, doesn't know how to interpret it. Clearly, he didn't know how to interpret that, but he learned something. And it also teaches us something, too, that Lucifer will read us and see what appeals to us. Here, our Lord responded with the Word of God, Scripture. So what's the devil going to come back with? He said, okay, I'll take you up on that. He reads you, and he'll see what what interests you and gets your attention. So Lucifer takes our Lord up to the pinnacle of the temple, right? And says, cast yourself down if you're the son of God, because it is written, he has given his angel charge over you to, to, to protect you, lest you even dash your foot against a stone. So jump off the top of the temple. Let's see what happens, you know. Our Lord's answer, thou shalt not tempt the Lord thy God. Right? Very simple, straightforward. But even that answer is very, very frustrating to Lucifer because that answer could be considered in two different ways. So our Lord saying, you're tempting me to tempt God, and I'm not going to tempt the Lord my God. Maybe Lucifer could understand it that way. Or maybe Lucifer could understand, I am the Lord your God, you should not be tempting me, right? Thou shalt not tempt the Lord your God. So Lucifer, again, you know, he, he can't outwit our Lord, certainly. And it's frustrating. He takes him up to the temple, the top of the mountain. You call it Tib Tibidabo, I will give to you. <laughs> and he shows him the kings of the world, kind of this, this display of virtual reality of looking at all the glory of the kingdoms of the world. Certain, Satan is probably, no doubt, presenting all these kingdoms in their most glorious light, you know. Um, to make them as tempting as possible, that our Lord would give him, that, that Lucifer would give our Lord the, co the kingdoms of the world if he would just fall down and worship him. And now there's Lucifer revealing the real satanic spirit here. He just craves to be worshipped. 
He wants you to validate his sin in claiming to be God. He wants you to validate that by worshiping him. And, uh, and of course, the kingdoms of the world populated by sinners for whom our Lord came to die. And when our Lord sees the kingdoms of the world, he doesn't see the brick and the mortar at all. He sees the sinners who come to die for them. And so he simply dismisses Satan. Be gone, Satan, for it is written, The Lord thy God, God alone shalt thou serve, and him alone sh shalt thou adore, and him alone shalt thou serve. Rather. And with that, Satan left him. But you know, Tom, those three temptations, uh, the one regarding our Lord's hunger, the concupiscence of the flesh, uh, the second one actually concerning the, uh, the pride of life. In other words, the importance of throw yourself off the temple. God will save you, you know, because of how important you are. Or the concupiscence of the eyes where we crave to have power, money, you know, control and all that. The, the, the possession of the kingdoms. <coughs> These temptations actually are mirrored in our Lord's suffering on the cross. These very same temptations are mirrored there. As far as the concupiscence of the flesh that our Lord denied, when he wouldn't turn the, the stones into bread, what do we hear our Lord say on the cross? I thirst. It's the middle word of the seven words, I think. I thirst. He's experiencing the thirst. We see him in the desert suffering that. Now we see him on the cross, suffering that. He, he vocalizes it, I thirst. And we see also on his head, a crown of thorns. And above his head, Jesus of Nazareth, King of the Jews, in Latin and Hebrew and Greek. Our Lord was offered the kingdoms of the world. Not long before that, they were, trying, they were going to take him and try to force him to make him their king. Lucifer offered him all the kingdoms of the world. And that was summarily rejected all of them. Right? He is the king of kings already. The crown of thorns, the inscription over our Lord's head, they're kind of, in a sense, a fulfillment of that temptation uh, that Satan used uh, to try to convince our Lord to adore him for the sake of, of the king's, kingship, the kingdoms. And, of course... The pinnacle of the temple, cast yourself down. Well, there is our Lord hanging on the cross. He would not descend from that cross. He would not come down from that cross. Uh, he refused to come down from that cross. He would die there. And uh, so I think those three temptations are very much, um, you might say, mirrored or even somewhat fulfilled uh, in our Lord they're crucified. And so uh, it's just something to maybe meditate about a little bit. You know? um, but the devil will try to use these temptations against us too. And we have to be very, very, very careful not to let him influence us. We have to respond as our Lord did. <clears throat> Each time <clears throat> professing our loyalty to Almighty God. That our loyalty is to Almighty God. Our loyalty is to our Lord, to the Holy Ghost, to the Divine Father. That is where our loyalty is. That is where our heart is, right? As our Lord would say, where your heart is, that's where your treasure is. So um, we ask our Lord to give us that resolve. We ask our Lord to make that very much of what this Lent is about for us. Uh, one word, one expression of sacred scripture, actually a statement of our Lord that we should keep in mind throughout this Lent is our Lord's word in the Garden of Gethsemane, Father, not my will, but thy will be, one, be, be done. Father, not my will, but thy will be done. We should say that many times a day. We should say that every time we're hard pressed by circumstances, we should say that every time we feel the hunger of Lent, <clears throat> or the discomfort, we should say that every time we feel the temptation to want the, the goods of the world, 
uh, out of greed and uh, avarice. We should say that every time, uh, that's the concupiscence of the eyes, and we should say that every time we get a feeling just too important, uh, as though what we feel, what we think, is the only important thing that matters, and nobody else matters, but we are the one thing that matters. Uh, that's how Lucifer thinks. And when we find ourselves thinking like that or beginning to act like that, again, we should come to mind, Father, not my will, but thy will be done. It's an act of supreme humility. We hear it coming from the mouth of our Lord, and our Lord should now hear it coming from our mouths too. So uh, I would recommend that uh, as a Lenten exercise to repeat that very often each day of Lent, and also to re read every day uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 13, I mentioned that before, St. Paul's Discourse on Charity, with an, an eye toward uh, not only memorizing it in the course of Lent, but putting it into practice. Especially the first injunction, charity is patient. Well, that corresponds very, very nicely to the words, Father, not my will, but thy will be done. Mm -hmm. So these two spiritual exercises can go together very, very nicely and produce some good results, I believe. Okay, very good. All right, well, thank you for that, Father. Thanks for your time tonight. God bless you. Well, Tom, thank you. God yeah. bless you, too. And all of our viewers and listeners, too. That's right. Thank you to all of our viewers for watching this episode of What Catholics Believe. Until next time, we ask that you all remember the words of Our Lady at Fatima to consecrate yourselves and your families to the Immaculate Heart of Mary, and to pray and do penance. Thank you, and God bless you.